When astronauts first ventured beyond the Earth's atmosphere, they didn't know as much about solar storms and the radiation they caused. On August 7, 1972, Big Bear Observatory in California monitored this flare. We now know it caused one of the largest solar radiation storms ever recorded. It's a legendary event at NASA because luckily it happened in the gap between Apollo 16's flight to the moon in April and Apollo 17's eight months later. You are go for orbit, go for orbit. Had it occurred during either of these flights, radiation might have killed the astronauts. Scientists know that intense solar storms can be as dangerous to astronauts as the gamma radiation from nuclear blasts. Solar flares release a cascade of high energy particles known as protons. Protons can pass through the human body, potentially causing chromosome damage and even cancer. Large doses of radiation can be fatal. And today, 30 years after the Apollo missions, NASA relies on space weather forecasts to protect astronauts against these dangers. While training to go into space, like most of us, astronaut Mike Fole had no idea how volatile the sun could be. I thought I knew about the solar system and the environment, but there was, when they talked about space weather, I went, space weather? What could that be? Late October 2003, on board the International Space Station, Foles about to find out exactly how dangerous space weather can be. The sun erupts in a series of events so powerful that they become known as the Halloween storms. October 28th, Boulder, Colorado. At the Space Environment Center, they watched the second largest flare on record explode from the center of the sun. The problem was the location of it. It was what we would call in the kill zone, where all the energy's coming straight out toward the Earth. In the line of fire is the International Space Station and Mike Fole. Larry Coombs has to warn NASA. We were constantly in contact with NASA, as well as they were back and forth with us. And NASA immediately warned Fole of the danger. They tell him to go to the most protected part of the station, the crew compartment, which is lined with polyethylene shielding. It offers some protection from radiation, although no area is completely safe. Now you're in survival mode. You just deal with reducing the immediate deathly effects at that moment. In two days, Mike Fole experiences as much radiation as he would normally receive in a week. The equivalent of being bombarded by dozens of x-rays on Earth. But it could have been a lot worse. If he had gone outside during the storm, he would have suffered acute radiation sickness, causing nausea and cellular damage within 10 minutes. We're currently at 1036 on the sundial. By 1130, it'll be too hot for humans to handle. Our sun is getting hotter. Since its birth four and a half billion years ago, its brightness has risen by 30% and scientists predict that it'll get even hotter, evaporating our oceans, melting the surface of the Earth, and ending life as we know it. But how? We know when the sun was born, how it nurtured us, and how it has also thrown a fair amount of danger our way. But that's nothing compared to what happens to life on Earth as the sun heats up and dies, unleashing an inferno that will threaten the survival of humanity on Earth. Death Valley in California, one of the hottest places on the planet. It provides a hint of what the sun holds in store for all of us. Astronomer Don Brownlee shares his vision of that fiery future. It's an extremely hot day here in Death Valley. But in fact, in the future, the entire planet will become much hotter than this. 
As the sun ages, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter, about 10% every billion years. Step into the sun's distant future. The hydrogen fuel is slowly running out, but the nuclear reactions at the heart of the sun are not slowing down. They're speeding up. Pressure at the core drops as the fuel is burned. Lower pressure no longer holds the forces of gravity at bay. Now gravity compresses the core, which heats the hydrogen up even more and makes the fuel burn faster. This increases the pressure coming from the core. The two forces balance again. But it's a cycle that continues as more fuel is burned and the sun gets hotter and hotter. Eventually, the sun will get so hot it'll actually melt the surface of our planet, believe it or not. On our sundial, shadowing the course of the sun's life from its birth at 6 in the morning to its death at 6 p.m., we are now at 10.36 a.m. At the moment, Earth is ideally placed in the solar system. It's not too hot or cold. As the sun heats up, the danger zone will move outwards, scorching the Earth. This will start a catastrophic chain of events that reads like the ultimate disaster movie. We'll lose our jungles, forests, and farmland as the desert grows, turning the surface of the planet into a giant series of sand dunes. Animals will be the first to be hit by the growing heat. They can't protect themselves as easily as humans can. Now things go from bad to worse, much worse. The increased temperature speeds up the removal from the atmosphere of the carbon dioxide that plants need to survive. Plants virtually disappear uh, from this planet, and anything that eats plants for a living uh, also goes with it. The glowing heat that gave us life now becomes so strong that it kills off the rich diversity of life on Earth. And as plants disappear, the oxygen they produce declines, making it harder for humans to breathe. We'll also lose most of our food supply. But even at this stage, some humans will probably still be around. People are very adaptable and very wiry. I think it's very likely that humans could be the last animals on this planet. Scientists don't agree on the exact date humans will disappear from the face of the Earth. But in a billion years from now, at 11.30 a.m. on our sundial, they predict on average it could be as hot as 160 degrees Fahrenheit. By then, the daytime heat could kill us. If we're still around, we may live underground and only come out at night. People have two options. We can build more and more sophisticated artificial environments on our own planet or we can potentially go elsewhere. I know it's a common belief that we are destined to live somewhere in the outer solar system. If we're going to survive as a species, we are going to have to find a new home, especially once the Earth's water starts to vanish. As the sun keeps getting hotter, Earth also gets hotter, and more and more water evaporates until all our oceans disappear. And it's this disaster that will make human life on Earth impossible. In Death Valley, the lake at Badwater dried out 10,000 years ago, leaving just salt flats. It's an eerie foreshadowing of what's to come. I would describe this area as totally alien. It looks like we're on a different planet, but it's our planet, and all of our planet will look like this And from space, it will look alien, too. Gone will be the blue and white planet covered with water and vegetation, to be replaced by a planet that looks more like Mars. By now, we need to be long gone from the neighborhood, moved to another planet, mere spectators to what the sun does next. Now the sun swells and changes color from yellow to red. It is becoming what astronomers call a red giant, an old star entering the last stage of its life. It completely fills the daytime sky. The atmosphere has gone, and it's like looking into space. 
It is some six and a half billion years from now. On our sundial, we are nearing dusk. And though the sun's now a senior citizen, it's more active than ever. Now the sun uses up the last of its hydrogen fuel in the core. It's burning helium, which burns ever hotter. The energy radiating out from the superheated core pushes the upper layers of the sun outwards, making it bigger and bigger. As it grows, the surface gradually cools, making it appear redder in color. Although the outer layers of the sun are cooling, the sun is reaching out toward us across the solar system. And just like stepping closer and closer to a fire, the Earth feels more and more heat. When the sun becomes a red giant, it's a dangerous phase for a planet like the Earth. It's quite spectacular. It becomes very much brighter, very much larger. Its heat will fry the Earth. By now, the surface of the Earth has long melted. But there's worse to come as the sun becomes more and more unstable. Violent thermal pulses of heat mean that the sun goes into overdrive. Its diameter expands a thousandfold. During some of these pulses, it expands out to basically the size of the Earth's orbit, and it will swallow the inner planet. Anything in its path is vaporized. First, Mercury burns up like a giant meteor. Venus will be next. But what about Earth? Will the home that has sheltered us for millions of years suffer the fate of its neighbors? As waves of heat tear through the sun, it sheds billions and billions of tons of material into space, and its gravitational pull weakens. This may just allow the Earth to move away from the sun and escape incineration. But scientists don't know for sure, and even if Earth escapes a fiery end, it is by now an unrecognizable molten planet. It's approaching 6 p.m., dusk on our sundial, and the sun's life as a burning star is over. But it's not big enough to blow up and become a supernova. Only superstars, over eight times as massive as our sun, explode. Eventually, it shrinks into a white dwarf, living on for hundreds of billions of years but only producing a faint glow. So this is the way the sun ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. The wonderful sun that provided the Earth heat and energy for billions of years will end up being a small star, not much larger than the Earth. The sun gave us life. With its death, all life on Earth will be gone. If humans still exist, we'll be somewhere among the stars. So next time you're on that beach enjoying the sun, remember, it won't last forever.